Here we go. Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. Uh, welcome back to Broker Talk. Most people wake up every day and their desire is to be good at their job, to thrive and grow. Some people wake up every day and they want to use their skills to help everyone and other people grow and thrive. My guest today is Jennifer uh, Conlon Wigan, and she is the executive director of Women's Lunch Place in Boston's Back Bay. Thank you so much for joining us today. Of course. So happy to be here, Larry. Thank you so much for the invitation. Well, I, thank, I, I'm, uh, I was lucky enough, my wife and I were lucky enough to be at a fundraiser that uh, your organization had. Was that a month ago? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it goes fast. I, under I understand it was uh, amazingly successful for you. It was, yeah. It's a collaboration with the um, Back Bay Neighborhood Association. And um, yeah, it's been a wonderful collaboration and very successful. Well, it was my first uh, opportunity to understand, grow and understand. There isn't a person out there that doesn't know that women uh, have a difficult time um, with uh, poverty, with homelessness, with uh, all kinds of issues that are going. What? Uh, tell me a little bit about the plans and, and what the Women's Lunch Place does. Sure. So Women's Lunch Place is a day shelter and advocacy center. Um, and we've been, we just entered our fifth decade of service um, from the same location in the Back Bay. Um, so we've we've grown a lot and changed over the years, but our essential work is the same. It's to be a safe space for women to provide healthy nutrition. And as we've grown, to provide more and more advocacy services, really wraparound services to address you know, just a variety of needs that our guests have. And what we've seen over the past several years um, is really a growing acuity of need of our guests, um, particularly around mental health and substance use disorder. Those are real drive, driving factors um, in the struggles women have, but they're really rooted in, in trauma. We know that um, the, the main pathway to homelessness for women is trauma. It's 92% um, of women who are homeless have um, violent you know, uh, physical and sexual assault in their histories, a lot rooted, it rooted in childhood. Um, and so that's, you know, not um, not unsurprising that that trauma has manifested in um, mental health and substance use disorders. Well, I, I think the combination of all those things, you're not just feeding these people. You're not just a place, come in, get something to eat and go, uh, right. God bless you, Godspeed. It, it's far more than that. The advocacy um, and nutrition, as we know, has changed over the years, and yeah. and what we need, and hydration is one of them. If you're yeah. out on the if you're out on the street, um, and you're hydrating, you're going to need a place to go to the bathroom, right. <laughs> you know, and right. and it's all of these very very simple things. How many people? Uh, how many women do you serve in a day, on average? On average, about 250 women a day come through come through the shelter. Um, the numbers have been increasing for sure. Our our meals numbers are going up. Um, our requests for advocacy services are going up as well. So, um, yeah, we we try to meet that demand every day. And um, you know, we we operate within the walls of Women's Lunch Place, but we also operate outside those walls. We deliver meals into the community. Um, we have our advocates out in the communities as well. So it's it's a pretty pretty busy, complex, you know framework of, of supports. One of the things that I loved the best was you have a room there where you um, sell uh, things that are made by the women. And uh, that to me is a wonderful advocacy. You're not feeding them. You're giving them an opportunity to be able to feed themselves. Not only that, they're, they're taking time to do something that they're good at and they like, and it gives them... Um, I'm sure a sense of uh, a reclaimed sense of self. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, that part? Sure, sure. So that that I have to say that doesn't exist on a daily basis, but we do that for special occasions when we'll have groups in that you know would like to um, look at the, the the wares and and perhaps um, you know purchase them for for gifts. Um, and it really is very meaningful to the women. You know, whenever we have an opportunity to 
um, have have a guest have agency on their own um, to be able to produce something, sell something, um, be rewarded with with um, the, the the proceeds from that sale is really uh, empowering and. Um, and it, it's it's one element of sort of the dignity focused work that we do. Um, it, little little things like we we try to give choice as much as possible. Um, you know, even if it's a toiletry, what shampoo would you like? Or um, at, at lunch, we always have a vegetarian option for folks. And you know, little things like that can really go um, a long way to for folks who just have so little choice really in their life and and have um, so little trust in systems um, that that have you know often often failed. You are on Newberry Street, and yes. Newberry Street in Boston is one of those uh, very special places in, in um, uh, San Francisco has Union Street, uh, New York has, what is it, Fifth Avenue uh, <laughs> is the equivalent. Um, it's it's a Tony area. Uh, Back Bay uh, happened years ago when they took the, the hills off of... <laughs> Uh, the uh where the state house is and they yep. just filled it in and and it, um the fact that you offer uh vegetarian um uh, options is better than many of the restaurants that are on that street <laughs> <laughs> uh uh but uh you use terms uh like uh uh, economic empowerment, and we just spoke about that, but empowering someone who has been uh, disempowered. Mm -hmm. um, what is that process? How uh, how does it? Uh, how do women adjust? And I know everyone's different, but yeah. uh, I know that every you woman can is different. Yeah, <laughs> and we we say that we meet every woman where she is at, um, because not every woman is is ready at the at the same time or for the same the same pathway. Um, and you know we we are a very low threshold um, agency, so you can come in through our door without any intake process at all. So um, we we want to make sure that folks at least can access you know a safe a safe space where 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 we are and, and healthy nutrition. But as far as empowerment, we really look at it as. Um, building self-sufficiency in women. And so often their experience um, has eroded their life skills. And so our work is to try to help, you know, knit that back together. Um, we, we really, uh, our whole service model is guest centered and it comes from a place of generosity and um, dignity and, and really being in a relationship with the woman so that she feels like she's in a trusted um, a space with, with people that um, have her best interest in, uh, in their heart and um, will try to help her facilitate her own pathway forward. So I think self-sufficiency is the real, the real key. And there's for us, you know, we have a, we have a, 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 a model around how we look at that. Um, and, and I can get very, you know, data, data, to, into that data but um but at the at the end of the day it's like looking at how you can knit together um those skills for women so that they can progress well uh you speaking about data that brings up a part of your background um mm -hmm. and you you uh know a great deal about uh data-driven uh business yeah. uh you have a background from digital equipment we used to call that deck now owned by hewlett yeah, packard i think <laughs> i'm a deck what, what 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 was your title there and what what work did you do yeah sure so i i entered there um before i graduated college um and i i had a great experience just sort of as an intern um, as well, but I entered through their financial development program and, and grew to be a business partner um, with many different businesses um, in, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, company, but it was, a uh, um, I, I still go back to that experience at DEC. It had a very forward looking um, founder and management system. And um, I was just lucky to be, mentored and cared about and people who were concerned about my professional growth and um you know and giving me opportunities to extend myself and that's something that I try to bring to women's lunch place and we have really invested a lot um in our talent strategy and in looking at um you know where we were in in pay scales and what we where we needed to be and how we could enrich um, the development of our staff and and create pathways for growth for them. And I think it really is just um, mirrors the, the work that we do with our guests. And we have had just some 
incredible great success in seeing people blossom when you give them the opportunity to extend themselves and um the feeling that they they like never saw themselves in that role and there, there they are succeeding every day it's been for me as a um senior manager it's one of the favorite parts of my job uh, absolutely success stories are 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 uh, what drive success if yeah. if you if the story is out there could you uh give us one or two uh success stories that uh resonate with you sure sure so um I mean, I can think of staff and guests, but I, I, I would maybe like to focus a little bit on on the guest success stories. Sure. Um, but we, you know, we have um, a variety of situations with women, right? We have some women who just have like chronic issues that have really prevented them from getting forward. And then we have some women who never in their wildest dreams could have imagined that they would have ended up homeless. Like they always had a job, they always had a home. And then some series of calamities, it's usually an illness or a divorce um, or, you know, just some like a substance use disorder that creeps up on them. Um, right. We have a, we have a grandmother who um, worked her whole life, retired and, you know, came under a gambling uh, situation, which she had never done her whole life. Right. So ended up losing her housing. So I think when we can help get those women like stabilized um, and, and be planful, like those, those are, I hate to say it, but like the simpler cases of like those unfortunate, like step-offs. Um, but I think the more complex cases are where our wraparound services really um, show the success. Um, we, you know, we have a woman who she stopped using um, crack cocaine, alcohol and cigarettes on the same day and just about a month ago she suffered she um celebrated one year of sobriety um and it's that's amazing that's amazing and it was all because of the the i mean it's because of her right because she made that sure choice. but we had all these new tools in place in terms of our clinical supports our recovery programs that allowed her to say i'm in this space i'm safe here i know these people and i can do this um, one of the first recovery programs we started was a smoking cessation program, um, which I was surprised to find out that you actually have a 25% better chance of um, recovering from a from a drug use if you also quit smoking at the same time. Um, so it was a really important element for us. And we started the program with two of our staff members who themselves had um, stopped smoking. And that was like so key because our guests were already connected with those one, with those staff members. They knew them, they trusted them. And so it really has been part of how we've tried to develop our programs with um, a lot of outreach in the community so that the folks know who they're, who they're entering that room with. Like it, right. that, these are big things to be opening yourself up to. And so you need to trust the folks in that room and, and, and trust your peers in that room. So learning experiences along the way. But um, when you see a woman who can, um, who can take those steps and she's now getting her GED and getting ready for employment, which is just unbelievable. That's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's real. I, I, I love the term talent strategy because many people have a variety of different talents. In fact, I think everyone has a, yeah. a, a secret sauce that makes them <laughs> them. And a lot of us never learn about that, what we're good at. Right. Um, uh, there was a whole group of people that grew up uh, and their parents told them you can be anything you want. Um, and that sounds supportive, but unless you have a strategy to identify what that talent is and then nurture that, right. it, it's uh, you you almost never get there because there's no roadmap. Yeah. So your 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 groups that meet together, these are a group of people that are all trying to do a similar thing get up and and stop smoking uh get rid of some of their other addictions what yeah. they are and they're they're in a group of people that are non-judgmental right and uh so often people who have e even your your staff uh they went through a similar thing do you ever hire people who have come through your program to work with your program we have actually had staff. Uh, we don't right now, but we have had staff in the past who um, have are graduates of, of Women's Lunch Place, um, and we do want there to be a number of um, you know years out out of, of out of the services that that we provide, um, so that we know that they're you know stable in that in that space. But it it has been it has been done. Yes, 
It's a wonderful, yeah. it's a wonderful thing. Um, even right now where, you know, we're, we're creating um, with collaborative partners, like volunteer opportunities for our guests in other organizations, because they would like that opportunity to give back, um, you know, in the, in the, in the communities that they, that they live. So it's, it's, it's nice to see that as well. Well, I, I know that we were invited through uh, a very close personal friend of ours, Deborah Bulkley. Yeah. And Deborah has been a volunteer uh, with your organization for a number of years. Yeah. Um, so uh, I know that other uh, women like Deborah, who is a fantastic, um, may be watching the show and may be interested. How do you offer um, your services to an organization like you? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, Shout out to Deb. She's a fantastic human being, as is her husband, Bill, and um, they're just fantastic supporters. Um, and she, you know, she she gets in that kitchen and rolls up her sleeves and, and does the hard work. So really have a lot of respect for that. Um, but yeah, we have a wonderful volunteer um, engagement uh, process at Women's Lunch Place. Before COVID, I know, and we've been ramping up since then, um, but our volunteer core was the equivalent of 16 full-time employees. So it, it was essential and remains essential to the work that we do. We had to kind of reconfigure um, over the past few years, but it's it's coming back really strong. Um, so we have a volunteer uh, manager, Allegra Mara, who's fantastic. And we, um, we you know, bring people in. We have an online system for people to apply through our website. And then we do um, orientations so that they understand and, you know, the, the population that we serve and the expectations we have and the guidelines we have in place for the safety of our guests and themselves and, and um, staff. Um, so we try to be really thoughtful and careful about um, how we bring people in and not just, you know, sort of um, put them in the middle of, of, of the space. Um, and of course, we also have um, corporate and community groups that come in and those, have, you know, don't have the same orientation process, but there's a lot of careful um, intake for them and and sort of instructions in the kitchen, et cetera. Um, and it's a it's a great engagement opportunity. You know, the kitchen is um, a beautiful, vibrant place. That's where the majority of our volunteer activity takes place. But we have more, um, you know, sort of one-on-one -on -one guest work through our Welcome Center and Resource Center as well for people who can sort of make that level of commitment um, as well. So it's, um, we, we couldn't, from the very beginning, Women's Lunch Place could not have made it without um, the support of volunteers. And we're sure. very grateful for the, for the sure. number of people in this community that stepped forward to do that work. And that website is awomensplace.com? It, no, it's womenslunchplace.org. Yep. <laughs> oh, dot org. Women's dot Lunch org. Place dot org. Exactly. Um, yeah. For you who have a little bit of time and want to help and give back, um, what is the a physical address? So if there's uh, yep. people out there that that want to stop by and, and see the good work that you're sure, doing. Sure. So we're at 67 Newbury Street. It's the corner of Newbury and Berkeley Streets in the basement of the Church of the Covenant. And there's a little uh, railing down a set of stairs into our front door and um, our staff would welcome you at the, at the guest center. Um, and if, you know, if anybody wants to reach out through, through the website and, and plan something in advance, we'd be happy to do that as well. So you use it, uh, a term in, on your website and it's in your bio proactive programming. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think programming often people sit down and say, okay, what is the need? And how can I serve the need? But when I hear proactive programming, I'm really thinking that you're starting with a template. Here's a program. And then the proactive part comes when you see what results you're getting. Do I understand that correctly? So, yeah, so it's actually a term that came out of our strategic plan, which we adopted two years ago, September, um, and has really rooted our, our growth and, um, and the advancement of the services that we provide. But it we um we started with the notion that we were very good at reactive work. When somebody walked through the door with a problem, we were very good about that. Um, but how could we get ahead of women's critical needs? How could we um, eliminate or reduce the crisis that that woman would enter into? And so that was really the focus of um, the programming. Um, efforts that we were making. So if we can, if we can provide recovery programmings, which we now do six days a week, how could that work to prevent a woman from a worse situation, you know, so it was really thinking about getting yeah. ahead of um, a lot of the the kind of um, 
situations that women are in that they they wouldn't feel safe receiving that programming in a non-gendered environment like Women's Lunch Place. So um, it really has been an incredible driver in terms of not only programming in the shelter, but in collaborations that we make. Um, you know, we have new collaborations with Healthcare for the Homeless, with Greater Boston Legal Services, you know, really expanding the breadth of services that we can offer um, to our guests that we just never kind of imagined before we we took on this right. like kind of mantle of being proactive. Well, I think the proactive part is is a, a critically important, and and I was excited when I I, I saw the phrase because I'm not familiar with uh, I'm familiar with many many uh, uh, plans that companies have, uh, uh -huh. but um, being proactive with it. Everybody says they're proactive, but I have watched and read uh, how you've changed. Uh, yeah. the programs uh, to make it and it and it centers not on the program but the individual it seems absolutely yeah and I mean, it, anyone who is in desperate need of help they're focused on themselves yeah. and it's very difficult to look beyond that because what am I going to do today I'm hungry right now yeah um many women who are homeless also have children who have become homeless. Yeah. Um, are they part of the program in any way? So the majority of our guests are single unaccompanied women, um, but we have children, you know, often in the shelter, sometimes with the mother, sometimes with the grandmother, um, more in the summer, more on the weekends, more in holiday weeks. Um, but our hours are seven to two. So that's usually the school hours. Um, we don't do specific programming for children and families but we always try to refer folks to the best resources for them sure. to support the children. Sure. Um, but I, I do joke with folks that if there's a, if there's a baby in the shelter, there's some elbows, you know, to get to that baby. So, um, you know, we're, we're always welcoming our staff is terrific, but we know that the, um, that that child needs special resources and special programming. They absolutely do. They're starting yeah. their lives and they, yeah. um, I think all of us at one point or another have been helped by someone. Um, and you remember, that help and yeah. you want to kind of pay it forward again Absolutely. you don't do this just on on the local level you're also involved in the uh national women's shelter network yeah. um you have a, a senior position there as well what do they do and how do they interact with what you're doing Sure. Um, we're a new organization. Um, I joined the steering com committee when we were um, just a few members <laughs> into the network. We're now at 187 shelters nationwide. We had our inaugural conference um, in September uh, in Miami, Florida, which is the home of the founding shelter, Lotus House. Um, we think that they are the largest women's shelter in the nation. They serve over 500 women a night. Um, wow. And it was really, um, I have to say, the brainchild of their founder, Constance Collins, who knew that she was a singular voice and would be stronger uh, together, which is our motto. Um, and so from, from that first meeting with her and, and um, Gretel, who's the director, it just felt like this is a community that we need to be belong in. This is a collaboration that we need to help build together. Um, so now we're um, transitioning to an independent 501c3 um, with a board, which I am so pleased to be a member of. Um, in October, we were down in DC presenting our plan of action to about eight different departments in the federal government that all have women facing offices. Um, and I really believe that we can make an impact in terms of um, resources and um, innovation for, for women in this space. I mean, our goal is to end um, homelessness, but the reality is that every single women's shelter that's part of this network is seeing an increase in demand on their services. We sure. have shelters that have doubled their capacity and they still can't meet the capacity that's coming through the door. So the resources have got to be in place. Um, you know, housing is ultimately the solution to homelessness. And as you know, I'm I'm trying to further an initiative in that area. Um, but we need to create these safe shelter spaces for women um, as they are, you know, sort of recovering from the the situation and and entering hopefully into a good housing situation. Well, you yes, and I, I'm glad that you brought that up. That um, let's talk about the development of. Um, uh, shelter sure. for these people uh if you'd like 
Yeah, sure. So um, again, rooted in our strategic plan, one of the pillars was housing. Um, and we'd been in the housing space in terms of document ready applications, searching, placement, helping women, you know, move into the space and fill it, fill in the space with resources. Um, but we really developed a specialty around housing stabilization. We have a 97% success rate in keeping really fragile women um, housed, which is, um, you know, unbelievable and, and really great. And it, it's all from our talented staff members. Um, but we started talking to the city and, and state and, and collaborators about where we should be in the residential space. Um, and we really felt that we needed a women's only um, housing situation because so many of these women have been traumatized in gendered situations and really needed that space to recover. So this is an opportunity um, on Beacon Hill. It's a, It was the affordable component of a larger luxury development. Um, if we can move this forward, Women's Lunch Place will acquire the buildings and be able to provide around 36 single residence occupancy units, which is a, a, a woman would have their own bedroom and there would be communal um, space for living and, um, and cooking. And um, we would have clinical uh, resources there as well. And it would have um, the strength of our organization you know, over four decades of service in this area in the Back Bay. Um, and we think that we can be an equally good um, service provider and neighbor on Beacon Hill. Um, and what a wonderful place for these for these women to, to be in a really resource rich environment um, within a within a miles walk to the shelter um, and you know lots of resources in terms of groceries and library and outdoor activities and um, you know for a, for an older especially older women, um, to be able to be in the central part of the city um, in a safe space um, with the incredible support that Women's Lunch Place would provide. Um, you know, we want to be um, a great, a great home for these women and we want to be a great neighbor um, on Beacon Hill. And I'm very hopeful that we will get there. Is it been helpful? Uh, we have a uh, a woman governor, Maura Healy, mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Um, has she been an advocate for this this group and and your uh, objectives? She she is an advocate for this. She's very strong, mm -hmm. um, you know, housing advocate, and um, had the opportunity to meet her um, in the past couple months. And um, she wants the resources of her administration to support efforts like this. Um, and we've been really lucky to be connected with many different people in the administration who are seeing how we can move this forward. So very lucky. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and we also have a female mayor in Boston, yep. Mayor and, Wu. Yes, and Mayor Wu's, may, uh, her Office of Housing under Sheila Dillon has been instrumental in um, first presenting us with this and working with us to try to move this forward. So, yeah, we're really, we're, I, I am, you know, really um, kind of blown away by the talent in, in city and state government that is um, stepping, stepping forward in this, you know, really critical, critical area. We need as you know, we need more housing in every in every sector, um, and it it's incredible to learn that the housing at the very top sector impacts the housing at the very bottom, right? I mean, we yeah. need we need um, more options at every level to create create space. So, I'm I'm hopeful that we'll that we will get there together. Well, here at Broker Talk, we're uh, focused on real estate quite often, and um, so we know that uh, affordable housing is very, very difficult to find. Yeah. Um, they even with forty B projects, a project where uh, you can avoid zoning by yeah. guaranteeing a certain percentage of the properties that you're going to build will be for affordable and affordable housing. Um, really doesn't impact uh, your people because uh, it's 80%, the way affordable housing is defined, it's 80% of uh, regular salary, um, the average salary yeah. in that area. So if you have no salary, you're far less than 80% yeah. and you can't afford much of anything. So you really need a program like this to support those people, either long-term or short-term. Right. Right. This, I mean, this would be deeply affordable housing. And yet, as you know, there's different, you know, um, percentage rates in terms of, um, yeah in terms of that, but this would be, you know, very deeply affordable housing for, for folks who have little or, or no income. I was very impressed when I read your your bio and your background that that you've been involved in pretty much the same thing in with different jobs and different companies over the years. What made you? 
How did you become this person? Yeah, it's so funny because now at, at my age, um, a lot of young women will be like, "How did you get to that job?" And you know, what did you do to get to that job? And I will, I think I never could have planned to to be in this job. Like I did not yeah. have like a pathway that I set out on. Um, but I think all the different elements of my background came together to, you know, make make this the right job for me at the right time and to allow me to be successful in it. Um, and I think, you know, my business background, I'm, you know, a finance major and I have my MBA and I worked in, you know, the for profit um, arena and the tech space. Um, but I, you know, always had, I, you know, I guess I was raised really with a progressive social justice kind of mission um, family and, you know, just great, great, models there in terms of if you see a problem step up and and try to try to be a solution um um very involved in, in politics i joke that i always had a, a button or a hat or a sign that had some politicians you know name on it um but that's that's our system right and it's it's a it's a wonderful system to be engaged in so i had those early you know early um modeling but i i really um kind of coalesced around like access and i think you know understanding at some point that um, that you have had opportunities that have not been afforded to other people. Um, and so for a long time, I spent, you know, time in the educational aspect um, of access for young girls and in, um, in a high school program. And, and really, I think just seeing the unique needs, they were often, they often had single mothers. Um, and so the, the, the needs of women and, and, and girls are really, um, under-resourced and very complex. Um, you know, we know that 70% of the folks living in poverty in our country are women and children, and um, we need a special effort there to, to turn that around. Um, so I think that that's been a motivator for me. And I think um, even small things, like I, I got my MBA at Babson College, um, and they very early on had a real focus on entrepreneurism. Um, and I think that that helps me to think outside the box and in ways that, you know, um, are really helpful when you have limited resources and sure. you, gotta, you have to sure. put something together. So um, yeah. I think little elements like that come together. I mentioned earlier, you know, great um, management role models in my early, you know, professional career. Um, and I, I try to model that in the work that I do and as well. So, right. yeah. Right. Um, what would you, as we wrap this up, uh, I wish we had another two hours, <laughs> well, but thank you. as we wrap this up, what are the biggest challenges and, and what for any of the people who are listening to this, what could they do to help you and um, your organization? Yeah. Well, it's very funny that I ended up in a role where like in almost any room I'm in, I'm asking people for money because I remember leaving college and people saying, you should get into sales. You learn so many skills. And I'm like, I could never be a salesperson. <laughs> but, um, you know, you get more comfortable with it when you care about the mission. So, of course, the work we do is um, grounded in individual um, foundation, um, corporation, you know, um, donations. And so um, that that accelerates our work, our our biggest expense, I tell people, is our is our personnel line. Our work is people work. Um, we can't, you know, bring in another machine to do the work we do. Um, we we need to focus on that. Um, so of course, that's that's foundational to the work we do. But people give in so many ways their expertise, their you know, their time in terms of um, you know coming in and doing some of the volunteer activities. I I know a lot of people I talk to in the kitchen say it's the best three or four hours of their week. You know, they just they come in, they're just zen, they feel like they're um, they're really supporting an important organization, and they you know they can see the benefits um, right in front of them. So I think that um, you know we have various advisory committees of course there's board service which is volunteer um but we have lots of different um like councils where we try to bring in people that have um backgrounds that can help us we have four incredible um women professionals who are our investment advisory council so people you know who don't have the time for like a major time commitment um can feel really good about doing you know a small piece every single element of that together well you know, yeah. helps us thrive. Absolutely. You, you are willing to use what, uh, whatever talents they have and right. apply them in, in the best way possible. Right. Exactly. It's, it, it, it's an amazing, uh, your organization, uh, I think is doing incredible work. Um, and I always finish the, uh, uh, a show and wonder, I should have asked this. So let me ask you the final <laughs> question. 
what haven't I asked you that I think is that you think is important? Yeah, oh, hmm. <laughs> that's always hard. Um, I guess you know maybe what what is the makeup of of the staff because they really do this incredible work. Um, and you know I always say I stand behind them because they they. They just get in there every day, but they're an incredible group of mostly women. We do have a couple of men on our staff um, that have really diverse backgrounds, you know, diverse in their lived experience, diverse in their cultures, diverse in their um, their race and their language and um, educational um, spaces and opportunities. And I think that um, that together we form this like incredible, you know, um, interwoven tapestry of of talents, and um, and that I think is like the key that 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 that's the secret sauce, <laughs> as you said, um, that really makes Women's Lunch Place special. And and I think that we now have a real vision for um, recruiting for, for to fit into that tapestry um, and make us even stronger. Well, uh, if you volunteer after hearing this, uh, please mention Broker Talk. Uh, we'd love to hear you uh, from you. Uh, Jennifer Collin w uh, Wigan uh, from Women's Lunch Place. Uh, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you, Larry. I really appreciated it. Enjoyed the time with you. I, I, I did as well. Look forward to talking to you soon.